people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. After its successful efforts at vaccinating adults and teenagers, the government of India has given a green flag to inoculation of children between the age of 12 and 14 years. This Wednesday, the health centers in the country started vaccinating children with Corbevax, a domestically developed vaccine. 50 million children in this age category will be vaccinated in the coming months. India started administering doses of COVID-19 vaccine to young people aged between 12 and 14 as public and private schools reopened. The government aims to swiftly expand vaccine coverage by also dropping a restriction on booster doses for those older than 60 only if they had a comorbidity condition. The children estimated by the government to number 50 million will receive the Corbivax vaccine made by Biological E, a domestic firm that secured emergency approval for its use in children. पहले सबको वैक्सीन की योजना की थी और आज है ना आज हम जैसे बच्चों की के लिए भी ना वैक्सीन की योजना की है तो है ना हम लोग के लिए हम लोग की सेफ्टी के लिए हम लोग आज वैक्सीन लगवा रहे हैं अपनी स्कूल में से और हमारे हमारे और हमारे परिवार के लिए वैक्सीन सही है In January 2021, India began its vaccination drives for doctors, healthcare and frontline workers. The aim was to ensure those at the forefront of the fight against COVID get proper protection at the earliest. In March 2021, vaccination was open to those above 60 and those over 45 with comorbidities. Later, the vaccination was open for all those above 18. India, with its vast population size, was being looked at closely by foreign observers as to how it will administer doses to its citizens. And what has been called the world's biggest vaccination drive, India has already administered over 1,800 million doses. Prime Minister Narendra Modi this week took to Twitter and appreciated the efforts of all those who have been instrumental in the successful Indian vaccination story. It has been due to the sustained vaccination efforts that India is now reporting only over 2,000 cases a day against the tally of nearly 300,000 cases per Delta wave and 400,000 cases during Omicron wave. The schools have reopened and now the young students too feel secure. पहले जब हम स्कूल आते थे तो फिर कोविड का डर रहता था लेकिन अब हम वैक्सीन लेने के बाद कोविड का डर इतना नहीं रहेगा अब थोड़ा कम है फिर दूसरा डोज भी लेंगे हम तो फिर कोविड का डर पूरा नहीं रहेगा हमारा Delhi's proactive efforts not only saved thousands of lives from covid in India but people across the world have been benefited with India made vaccines The vaccine Maitri program that suffered a temporary halt during the country's second wave has continuously transported vaccines around the world, especially to the third world countries who haven't been able to produce on their own or procure enough for its population. India has also administered over 20 million precautionary doses and has now allowed anybody over 60 years to receive the same. The government says it is committed to administer every single Indian with COVID jabs and keeping in view the positive reception among the Indian mass regarding the vaccine, the country is likely to meet all its targets and set benchmarks for others to follow.
Moving on, massive protests have erupted across Sri Lankan capital Colombo against the worsening economic crisis in the country. People led by opposition leaders chanted slogans against the government and asked for regime change. The island nation is going through unprecedented times owing to a forex crisis that has severely affected the fuel supply, thereby creating a shortage that has affected nearly all aspects of people's everyday lives. Hundreds of Sri Lankans led by opposition leaders took to the streets of capital Colombo against the worsening economic crisis in the country. The crisis that cropped up with shortages of forex reserves has triggered a massive fuel shortage with people suffering the woes of hours-long load shedding and rapidly escalating food inflation. They sloganeered against Rajapaksas who have been at the helm of Sri Lankan affairs, accusing them of mismanaging the country's economy and failing to bring enough foreign currency in times of crisis. Protesters let off firecrackers and marched near the president's office where they were stopped by the armed security personnel. People said their livelihood was getting affected severely due to the crisis. They also chanted slogans demanding a change in the regime. <laughs> The Indian Ocean nation's foreign exchange reserves have fallen 70% in the past two years to about $2.31 billion, leaving it struggling to pay for essential imports, including food and fuel. Meanwhile, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who had earlier changed several ministers in a snap cabinet reshuffle, addressed the nation and said his government was in negotiations with the International Monetary Fund in order to seek its help in resolving the country's crisis. He also informed that his government had set a target of cutting its trade deficit by about 14% to $7 billion this year from $8.1 billion last year. Sri Lankan government is also expecting $5 billion in remittances, which might provide some reprieve to the island nation. Jatyantara Mulya Aramudala Samaga E.A. Pavatu Saka Chavat Me Aramunin Kaleka E. Saka Chavat Tulin අප බලාපොරොත්තු වන්නේ වසරකට අප ගෙවිය යුතු ණයවාරික ස්වෛරීත්ව බැඳුම් කර ආදිය ගෙවීම් සඳහා ක්‍රමවේදයක් සලසා ගැනීමයි. ජාත්‍යන්තර මූල්‍ය අරමුදල සමග මා කල සාකච්ඡාවට පසුව වාසි හා අවාසි අධ්‍යයනය කොට තවදුරටත් ඔවුන් සමග එක්ව කටයුතු කිරීමට මා තීරණය කළා. Earlier, after the appeal made by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the government had imposed curbs on the import of non-essential commodities, including fish, footwear and wine. Not only the Sri Lankan's reserves have dipped to $2.3 billion, the government is also due to repay a debt of about $4 billion in the remainder of this year. Sri Lanka has received financial support from its neighbour India and China in the form of credit lines and currency swaps, but that hasn't proven enough to pull it out of the crisis. The government has thus far made several assurances saying crisis will be over in a few days from now, but all the cameras could have witnessed so far is lengthening queues for fuel and gas and hours of darkness every day. Moving on, on the sidelines of the 49th session of UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, a large number of ethnic Sindhis held anti-Pakistan demonstrations and urged the global body to intervene in the rapidly deteriorating human rights situation in Pakistan's Sindh province. Sindhis accused Pakistan of subjecting them to a form of state crackdown that has severely impacted their lives. <laughs> 
shouting anti-Pakistan slogans and urging Pakistani authorities to stop systematic ethnic cleansing of minorities in Pakistan. Scores of Sindhi activists gathered outside the United Nations Human Rights Council on the sidelines of the 49th regular session of the global body. The demonstration was staged to have attention of the global community towards the Sindhi issue which the activists said was deteriorating by the day. Activists urged the international community to intervene against the flagrant violations of human rights in Sindh province of Pakistan where both the state's direct crackdown and its complicity in Islamic radicals' attack on all aspects of their lives had pushed them to the edge. They are taking over lands, hundreds of thousands of acres of land by military in these proxies. They are curbing, they are killing the democratic protests of Sindhi people. For example, if there is a protest against land grabbing, they charge and they arrest hundreds of people and for, for, for under terrorism charges. Likewise, all those, the, many of these, the hundreds of Sindhi youth are missing. They have been abducted and have been missing for years. They have literally creating a hell for the minorities. Even today, a nine-year-old girl has been forcefully abducted. And this happened in the last three months alone. There have been 15 girls who have been abducted. And they are literally, they want Sindhi people to die and to disappear. Testimonies of Sindhi say that the situation has grown so gruesome that security forces abduct people in broad daylight, sometimes dressed in plain clothes and other times in official vehicles and uniforms. They are unable to act with impunity because the government refuses to take any action on allegations of enforced disappearance and has not once brought a perpetrator to justice. There have been around 1,300 known cases of enforced disappearance in Pakistan's Sindh province alone since 2010. The disappeared are often human rights and political activists or journalists who have spoken out against the government's policies and actions against Sindhi people, including environmental degradation, the maladaptation of ancestral lands, displacement and the loss of livelihoods, and large-scale development projects without the consultation or consent of the local communities. Activists apprised that forced conversions and marriages have also become a common phenomenon in Sindh and as per different estimates, around 1,000 women and girls from religious minorities are abducted and forcibly married off to their abductors every year. Human rights observers have expressed deep concerns over the deteriorating situation. We have following the situation in Pakistan for more than 20 years and it's really um, sad to see that the silent genocide will continue in Pakistan, that even international organizations ignore this fact that the disappearance of minorities here and systematically exclusion of minorities. Political, in, in any layer you will see that minorities are ignored. If you see that the, the, the percentage of minorities like Sindhi, Baloch has been dramatically going down and it's concerning. We, we even had discussed this internal in organization that maybe 2035 Pakistan will be totally minority free and that is very concerning about it and with time the situation is rapidly heading south with the province witnessing a sudden escalation in crimes targeting religious minorities 2021 Human Rights Watch report said that Pakistan went out of its league and authorities used draconian sedition and counter-terrorism laws to stifle dissent and strictly regulated civil society groups and organizations critical of government actions or policies. 
Over time, Sindhis have held peaceful demonstration against what is called Pakistan's mistreatment towards them. They have even raised the issue on a number of global platforms, but that has not been able to alter the situation of ground. People, however, say their movement against government discrimination will not end until they are served justice. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al qadimi visited Iraq's Kurdish capital Erbil past week after it was hit by a dozen of Iranian ballistic missiles. While touring residences and Kurdistan 24 TV station that were damaged by the missiles, Qadimi also met with the Kurdistan's regional government leaders. According to Kurdish officials, the missiles came down in areas near a new U.S. consulate building on March 13. This has been referred to as an unprecedented assault on the capital of autonomous Iraqi Kurdish region that appeared to target the United States and its allies. U.S. officials said no Americans were hurt, nor were U.S. facilities hit. Kurdish authorities said only one civilian was hurt and no one killed. Iran's Revolutionary Guards claimed responsibility for the missile assault. Iranian state media said the Revolutionary Guards Corps had launched the attack against what it referred as Israeli strategic centers in Erbil, suggesting it was revenge for recent Israeli air strikes that killed Iranian military personnel in Syria. The Iraqi Kurdish regional government has called on the international community to carry out an investigation. In its first comprehensive human rights report since last year's coup, the United Nations has said that Myanmar's military has engaged in systematic human rights violations, some of them amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said that security forces have shown a flagrant disregard for human life, using air strikes and heavy weapons on populated areas and deliberately targeting civilians. The report further added that many victims were shot in the head, burned to death, arrested arbitrarily, tortured or used as human shields. The UN report said that it was based on interviews with a scores of victims of abuse and witnesses whose accounts were corroborated with satellite imagery, verified multimedia files and open source information. The report also said that at least 543 people had been killed for their perceived support of the military government. The junta, which overthrew the elected Aung San Suu Kyi government, has in the past year scolded the UN and its independent experts for interference and what it calls reliance on distorted information from partisan groups. Taiwan's military past week held live fire drills in its northmost territory, a remote island that is strategically located just off of China's coast. Soldiers fired shells at a floating Red Cross in the water, meant to represent advancing enemy forces. The echoes of machine guns and cannon fire reverberated around the coastline. Although the Defense Ministry says the exercises on Dongin, part of the Taiwan-controlled Matsu archipelago of the coast of China's Fuzhou, are routine. They are happening as Taipei has raised its alert level after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, wary of Beijing making a similar move. Taiwan has not reported any unusual activities by Beijing since the Ukraine war began. On February 5, a small, propeller-driven Chinese aircraft flew very close to Dongin. Taiwan does not publish details of its military presence there, but the Dongin Area Command has been at the front line of Taiwan's defenses since the 1950s. In a sign of deepening military cooperation between Japan and the United States, amphibious Japanese troops and U.S. Marines this week practiced airborne landing assaults together using tilt-rotor Osprey troop carriers for the first time. 
the drills in the foothills of the Mount Fuji on Tuesday involved 400 troops from Japanese Amphibious Rapid Deployment Brigade and 600 U.S. Marines. It was part of a three-week joint exercise meant to hone interoperability between Japan and its U.S. ally. Japan is revising a decade-old national security strategy as it feels more threatened by China's growing military assertiveness. That upgrade to defense policy guideline is expected to call for the country to take a more active role alongside Washington in regional security. Moving on. India is well known around the world for its vibrant culture and colorful festivities. Each season brings along with itself a bunch of festivities which are celebrated with great zeal and fervor all around the country. One such festival is that of Holi, which comes during the spring season. Let's have a look at this year's Holi celebrations in the northern part of the country. One of the most awaited festivals in India, Holi was celebrated in the northern region of the country with singing, dancing and smearing colours on one other. Although the festival is celebrated throughout the length and breadth of the country, it holds immense importance in the bridge region, where the festival begins a week ago and continues well after the festival. Dropped in colours, devotees in various cities of Uttar Pradesh like Ayodhya and Mathura sang and danced in holy processions as they took to the streets to celebrate the festival. The historical town of Barsana in Mathura observed the Latmar Holi. It is an age-old tradition in which women use lathis or bamboo sticks to beat the men for, who protect themselves with shield. Meanwhile, devotees in Varanasi town of Uttar Pradesh gathered at the banks of River Ganges to celebrate the festival by smearing pyre ashes. Citizens offered prayers to the holy god of destruction, Lord Shiva, and threw ash from cremation pyres and smeared it on each other's faces to celebrate the occasion at the Manikarnika river front. It is believed that the tradition of the festival started when Shiva played holy with pyre ashes with his aides to celebrate the return of his wife, goddess Parvati. जो बाबा के प्रिय गण है भूत पेद प्रसाद निशाचर दृश्य दृश्य शक्तियाँ यक्ष गंधर व किन्नर वो जो होली मनुष्यों के बीच नहीं खेल सकते तो उन भक्तों को प्रसन्न करने के लिए बाबा विश्वनाथ स्वयं मणिकर्ण का तीर्थ पर मध्यान स्नान करने आते हैं और उसके बाद अपने उन सभी प्रेमी भक्तों के साथ चिता भस्म की होली खेलते हैं Popularly known as the Festival of Colors, the festival fills the air with jubilation and engulfs everybody in its exuberance. Every year, Holi falls after the full moon night in the Hindu month of Fagun, which coincides with the Gregorian month of March. Holi is celebrated in different forms in other parts of the world too. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.